In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Victorian commentator on this morning's Gospel states the problem very clearly. The difficulty of this parable is well known, and the variety of interpretations is very great. It is sufficient to state that the steward has been supposed to signify the Jewish hierarchy, the tax collectors, Pilate, Judas, Satan, St. Paul, and Christ. Clearly, we have a challenge before us in reading this gospel. But let's try and imagine the context in which it's first delivered and how people might have heard it. The steward, in fact, is not an unfamiliar figure in the Judea of the first century. He's one of those people who is making his living by administering somebody else's property and is supposed to make his income out of that. At the most extreme, this could be the way that tax collectors worked, the tax farmers of the era. They had to raise a certain amount of money and however much more they raised was their salary and that was up to them to set. It explains why the tax collectors in the New Testament are even more unpopular than the inland revenue of our own day. If you can imagine an inland revenue system in which those administering it were allowed to set the rates that they collected, you can just begin to see why it's a bit of a problem. So the steward is presumably doing what, as all Jesus' or his audience would know, most stewards did. Raking off a considerable amount of the produce from the property for his own use. But there's a limit to how much of this you can get away with, especially if it is actively interfering with what the proprietor finally gets. This has been notified to the proprietor and he's asked to see the accounts. The steward's character is not terribly impressive. He can't be bothered to get a degrading manual job. He's much too sensitive for that. And he's much too proud. He has much too much self-respect to go begging. So he starts thinking and comes up with a cunning plan of Baldrick-like proportions. He will adjust the accounts creatively. Now this is where it gets a bit difficult because we don't know exactly what he's doing. Is he actively robbing his master of what's due, a hard core of the produce that the master ought to be collecting, and so in effect getting his own back on his master for sacking him? Or is he simply adjusting the accounts so that what the master receives and what passes through the books is all and only all that is actually due without his own rake-off? We don't know. But he's certainly messing around with the books in a way which he believes will create a kind of security for him. He's paying insurance to future friends. And if he is indeed knocking off his own rake-off from what's coming in, he might even be pleasing his master as well. He may not be a very attractive personality, but he's not stupid. And then the great surprise in the parable, or perhaps not too much of a surprise if people have been listening to Jesus' parables before. Again and again in Jesus' parables, the figure who exercises power turns out to be almost manically irresponsible, as if the universe is governed by a millionaire with a, an overinflated sense of humour. Think of the way in which in other parables, wealthy people fill up their son's wedding reception with street people. Think of the landowner who gives the same wage to those who've laboured for one hour and those who've laboured for nine hours. Think of all those parables where the master, the lord, the owner, the one with power, reacts with an almost anarchic irresponsibility to the oddities of human behaviour. And perhaps you can see why the master in this parable might not have been quite such a surprise after all. Nice bit of work, he says to the steward. You understand what you're doing. Well, what are we to make of it? There are still those who say, well, surely 
Jesus cannot be commending dishonesty with money. And there are people who try to make various kinds of moral shape out of the parable. There is a moral shape to it, but it takes a bit of digging for. And if, like, if unlike the steward, we feel we have the strength to dig a bit, maybe something will come through. Like so many of the parables, it's essentially addressed in the first place to each hearer. Try a thought experiment, says Jesus. Imagine you are this sort of person. We've just heard in the previous chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, the parable of the prodigal son, where Jesus, as it were, begins by saying, imagine you're a bored, ambitious, younger son, you want to make your name, you want to get your inheritance now. And the parable ends disconcertingly by saying, and then imagine you're a perfectly well-behaved and obedient older son, full of fury, resentment and envy, because your worthless younger brother has been received back and forgiven. So here, the parable begins by inviting you and me to imagine that we are dishonest business managers. We are betrayers of trust. We've been given something in trust to make the most of, not for ourselves, but for something else or someone else. What have we been doing? Well, we've been making the most of it for ourselves. What we have in trust we have exploited, absorbed for our own needs or our own fancies. And if the steward is as anxious as he seems to be in the story, we haven't even bothered to save up against a rainy day. The reckoning is coming. We have not been giving the proprietor what we're meant to, what he's trusted us to give. And so in panic, though thoughtful panic, as you might say, the steward begins to scratch around for something that might help. A faint shift in understanding towards the idea that perhaps his security doesn't lie in his ability to manipulate his economic circumstances and guarantee his individual wealth. Perhaps his security lies in the possibility of being welcomed. Perhaps his security lies in building relationships, not possessions. What, after all, lasts? Mammon, possessions, money, wealth, comes and goes. Just possibly, relationships don't in the same way. It's quite a big risk to take because again, in the previous parable of the prodigal son, we discover that the prodigal son seems to have spent quite a bit of money on friends who turn out not to be loyal when things go wrong. But the steward in the parable is doing his best hoping for the best, using at last the stuff of this world to create something that endures, which is not prosperity, but lasting trust, stable connection, the possibility that he might be welcomed, that he might have friends. And typically, the anarchic master with his overdeveloped sense of humor is really rather tickled by this. It's prudent, it's sensible. And it's almost as if Jesus is suggesting that what the steward really owes to the master is not just the mechanical delivery of what is his own, but this work of creating relation, creating a kind of security, a kind of connectedness, that doesn't depend on material security. So that when the roof falls in, when the world ends, there is something that lasts. And that something is not what we have accrued for ourselves as individuals. It's the relationships we've built. The steward, we might say, is driven into being generous against his will. He's not a particularly nice man, he's not a particularly moral man. But he has a faint idea which side his bread is buttered on. Like many characters in Jesus' parables, he's not meant to be a saint. He's not held up for our imitation as an example of impeccable behaviour. But he is held up for our admiration 
as somebody who knows, as the old saying goes, how many beans make five. He's discovered in the hardest way possible, the need to build for something more than individual security, more than temporary stability. And he knows that only happens when some adjustments are made in relations with others and in relations very particularly between those who have and those who haven't, between those who are secure and those who are vulnerable. And he sets about it. Again, it's probably no accident that in the following chapter of Luke's Gospel, the following section, I should say, of Luke's Gospel, we turn to the parable of Dives and Lazarus, and we discover the fate of somebody who has built no relationship that lasts, who is left painfully, fatally isolated on the far side of things when the roof falls in and the world ends. So maybe at least one of the strands that's running through this parable, of which all sorts of interpretations are still possible, one of the strands is simply this. We are in a position of trust in our world. Habitually, regularly, with all kinds of skill and ingenuity, we betray that trust. We take the rake off of creation, both in practical material terms and in terms of our relations and our approaches to other people. And doing that is a failure to give the proprietor what is due. Failure to pay our true debt to God. Because our true debt to God, what God trusts us to do in the world, is to build connection. Again and again, we sever connection, we try to protect ourselves and run away from that connection. Again and again, we discover the emptiness and the toxicity of that. And perhaps that's why in the Sacrament of Holy Communion, what we see is the stuff of this world, the resource of this world, the harvest of the earth that we live in. We see this held up, offered to God and transfigured so as to become something that binds us together. Through the sacrifice and gift of Christ, we are bound together for eternity. We are welcomed into the eternal habitations that the gospel speaks of. We are connected to one another in the body of Christ and connected to Jesus and connected through Jesus to his eternal Father in the eternal Spirit in such a way that neither life nor death will alter that. That's what happens as we communicate, as we share in the elements of the Holy Eucharist. And if we've learned from our Eucharist that that is indeed how we pay our debt to God, by working for connection in our world, we will seek a Eucharistic way of living in the world, using the stuff of this world to build, to connect, to express a faithfulness to one another that can outlast even death. Some of you will have seen this morning on the BBC website the extraordinary story of the church in Beirut, where the nave was more or less destroyed by the horrific explosion last week, and the sanctuary remained with the oil lamp still burning on the altar. The priest was interviewed about this and spoke about it understandably as a sign of what can't be shaken. As if in the midst of the horrors of death, pain, disaster in Beirut, and our prayers are so much with the people of Lebanon at the moment. In the midst of that, there was not a quick solution, not a happy ending, but simply the reality of something not extinguished, not shaken, an oil lamp on a table, a light burning, a table 
which is the sign of the connectedness between God and creation, and the connectedness that Christ creates between human beings. That doesn't shake or fall. That is our eternal habitation. And so if and when we are feeling that our own future is as insecure as that of the steward in the parable, that when the accounts are called in, our record won't look very impressive, what are we to do? We are to ask where and how we build, where and how we connect, where and how we enable others to welcome us. We do it as believers, strengthened, reinforced by the gift that we share in the sacraments. But the whole world needs to learn that material security is a means, not an end. The whole world needs to learn, Christian or non-Christian, that what we're here for as human beings is the building of a connectedness and a solidarity that doesn't depend on separations between rich and poor, secure and insecure. It depends on the recognition that we can only be secure, wealthy, prosperous, together by making a trustworthy, a stable, as we like to say these days, a sustainable environment. We can do that in our relationships, in the way we actually respond to the need, the feeling, the situation of others. We can do it in our family lives, in our working lives. We can do it as countries and societies internationally, building what lasts. But overall, is that deeply disturbing and yet somehow strangely reassuring picture which Jesus so repeatedly comes back to. The one who has the power over all, the master, the proprietor, seems utterly, utterly negligent of his security, of his status. He's prepared to laugh at being defrauded by the unjust steward in the parable. He's prepared to risk the resentment and the anger of those who feel they haven't been treated according to their merits when he shows mercy to others. And that's how divine power is at work, strangely, in the universe. With that utter, selfless, almost mocking indifference to what we think of as status and security. The Lord, the master, the proprietor, the householder, the landowner, in these parables, again and again. The mad millionaire with the overdeveloped sense of humour, who will not keep the rules, who will not go by what convention expects of him, who will not stand on his dignity, but will not only judge, but also laugh at our failures and open his arms to welcome us in a solidarity, a love and a connectedness that can never be broken. And out of that welcome, we turn to welcome others and to help others welcome us in lasting holy communion. <laughs>